Good evening. You know, one of the great fascinations of astronomy is that one's always liable to find the unexpected. And that happened on February the 24th to Ian Shilton. At the Las Campanas Observatory over in Chile and South America, he was taking a photograph of the large Magellanic Cloud. And when he developed that photograph, he found something very strange indeed, a bright star where no star had been before. And he realized straight away it was something remarkable. He had, in fact, found a supernova. And not long afterwards, it was discovered independently in southern Africa by an amateur, Colin Henshaw. And he photographed it too. And there's a star field, and here is the supernova. And as you can see, it is really very bright indeed. That was in the large Magellanic Cloud. But before we start talking about supernovae, what exactly are the Magellanic Clouds? Superficially, they look rather like broken off parts of the Milky Way. But I'm afraid you can't see them from here. They are too far south in the sky. Here's a picture of the Milky Way. You can see it there running across the center of the plate. And the Magellanic Clouds are to the south, down there below the main Milky Way itself. And they are, in fact, independent galaxies. And they are really spectacular. They're so bright that you can see them with the naked eye, and even strong moonlight won't drown the large cloud. And they contain objects of all kinds, stars of various kinds, and also nebulae. Look, for example, at the lovely Tarantula Nebula, which is a cloud of dust and gas, inside which we believe fresh stars are being created. Now, we get nebulae in our own galaxy. Now, there is one, for example, in the Sword of Orion. But the Tarantula Nebula is very much larger and more brilliant than that. And if, in fact, it were as close as Orion's sword, it would cast shadows. But the Orion Nebula is in our own galaxy, and the Tarantula is in the large cloud of Magellan, which is an independent galaxy, a satellite of our own galaxy. And according to the Royal Greenwich Observatory estimate, the distance is about 155,000 light years. Now, that may sound a long way, and of course it is, but it's very much closer than any of the other major galaxies. For example, the Andromeda Galaxy, the nearest big spiral, is over two million light years away. And so the large Magellanic cloud really is cosmically on our doorstep. And to show you what I mean, we've constructed a model in the studio just to show you how close, relatively speaking, the large Magellanic cloud really is. So here, imagine I'm standing by the Andromeda galaxy, two million light years away, and there's a model of the Andromeda galaxy, which, as you can see, is a spiral. Now, I'm going to walk across the studio, and we have here a model of our own galaxy, made to the same size and at the correct relative distance. And here it is, once again a spiral. There's the position of the sun, way out towards one edge, and there are the two clouds of Magellan. And as you can see, they are very close indeed. And the Andromeda galaxy, 2.2 million light years, is way, way in the distance. Of course, in fact, the Andromeda galaxy is a spiral even larger than our own. But by sheer bad luck, it's placed almost edgewise onto us, so the beauty of the spiral is lost. The large cloud of Magellan isn't anything like as large as that, or as large as our Milky Way system. But it is, cosmically speaking, right on our doorstep. And if we can't have a supernova outburst in our own galaxy, then an outburst in the large cloud of Magellan is definitely the next best thing. The large cloud, incidentally, is not a well-marked spiral, such as Andromeda. There are indications of a barred spiral form, but they are not very marked. They contain stars of all kinds, and we also have there occasional novae. Now, a nova is not a new star, as its name might imply. It's really made up of two stars going around their own common center of gravity. One's an ordinary star, and the other's a very small, very dense, massive star called a white dwarf. And the white dwarf is pulling material away from its companion, and this goes on piling up until finally things become unstable, and there's a violent, short-lived outburst. But also in the large Magellanic cloud, a little while ago, Dr. John Abels, using the great radio telescope at Parkes in New South Wales, discovered something else. He discovered a pulsar, which is a rapidly varying radio source, and is believed with a remnant of a supernova. Now, a supernova is not like an ordinary nova. It's very much more violent, and they are not very common. In fact, over the last thousand years, only three have been definitely seen in our own galaxy. There was one in 1054, and that's left the remnant that we call the Crab Nebula, which you can actually see with a small telescope. There was another in 1572, and there was yet another in 1604. But of course, all those were before the invention of the telescope, and astronomers would very much like to study a nearby supernova with modern-type equipment, and so far, they've not been able to do that. We have, of course, seen plenty of supernovae in external galaxies, 
And quite recently, there was one in the strange galaxy we call Centaurus A. Again, too far south to be seen from here. And there is the galaxy with a strange dust band across it, and there is the supernova indicated by the pointer. But that was more than 10 million light years away. On that occasion, we presented a Sky at Night program, and we were joined by Dr. Paul Murden of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And uh, we are delighted to have Paul with us again now. Paul, I imagine you're pretty excited about this new supernova. I think all astronomers who study supernovae are bound to be excited about the brightest supernova since 1604 and the only one of this brightness that's ever been studied with modern equipment, Petra. Well, what about the actual discovery? Well, the, the, the supernova was discovered, as you said at the beginning of the program, by Ian Shelton of Las Campanas, who took a photograph of the field of the Large Magellanic Cloud and found the supernova at fifth magnitude on the photograph. At the, about the time that he was developing this photograph, in fact, um, another uh, astronomer, uh, Las Campanas, Oscar Duhalde, who's a night assistant, was taking a stroll on the mountain top. And he noticed in the rather bare region of the large Magellanic clouds, not very many stars in it, bright stars, he noticed the, uh, the supernova at uh, fifth magnitude, discovered it with his naked eye. The next person to see it, as far as I know, was Albert Jones, a 70-year-old New Zealand amateur. Yes, I know him. Uh, he's, uh, I think, got the world's record for the number of variable star observations. And he noticed it uh, through cloud, I think a tribute to his knowledge of the constellations that he should notice even in, in a fragmentary sky, the uh, supernova. Yes, indeed. Uh, he got in contact with Rob McNaught at the UK Earth Satellite Research Unit at Coonabarabran, who confirmed it and notified the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. And it was that that uh, then set off the train of scientific events um, uh, naming the supernova 1987A. What about the magnitude of discovery? It was easily visible with the naked eye. Yes, it was the fifth magnitude and very easily seen at, um, uh, by Duhalde and Jones, for example. When McNaught got the announcement of the discovery, uh, he realized that he and another amateur in New South Wales had been taking pictures of the LMC uh, to patrol it for Novi. And he realized he had a, a one-day-old film in his camera, uh, which he developed and found uh, there the, was the supernova at sixth magnitude, just coming into naked eye visi visibility and recorded by uh, McNaught on this photograph. Uh, since about the time of the discovery, it's been magnitude 4.4, 4.5, um, been hanging in there uh, relatively constant uh, ever since. As we know, supernovae are of two very different kinds, type 1 and type 2, and they have different origins. Which type do you imagine this one is? I think it's very clear. Uh, type 2 supernovae, by definition, are supernovae with hydrogen lines in their spectrum, and uh, this supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud very definitely has hydrogen lines. It's quite clearly a, a type 2. And that fits in rather nicely with the discovery of the, of the progenitor of the supernova. That is to say, the star which did the exploding. Because right spot on the position of the supernova is a star called Sanduliac minus 69202, which is a very massive star. It's a B supergiant star, probably about 30 times the mass of our sun. It was magnitude 12.2 up to uh, a few hours before McNaught's uh, photograph showed it at sixth magnitude. So that uh, very nicely uh, deline delineates the moment of the explosion. Well, if it really is a type two supernova, what about the light curve? Do you think it's going to get a lot brighter? Uh, type two supernovae are a bit of a rag bag. They're a bit of a, a mixed classification of, um, of uh, light curves there. Uh, it might be that we're at the maximum of the light curve, in which case uh, the light curve will decline rather rapidly down to sixth magnitude. But some type two supernovae uh, have a pre-maximum plateau, um, uh, a couple of magnitudes fainter than the maximum. Uh, in 1940 and 1941, two supernovae were seen like yeah. this, for example. And it isn't clear where in the light curve we are at the moment. We might be uh, at the pre-maximum plateau, in which case the supernova will brighten by a couple of magnitudes in the middle of March before fading away. Uh, or it might be that the, uh, if, if we're at the maximum already, then the uh, supernova should start to decline um, sometime in the middle of March and uh, be out of sight uh, to the naked eye by uh, May. We've got to wait and see, haven't we? Well, Paul, we've been talking about type 2 supernovae, but I think some people who are watching may not quite understand what a type 2 supernova is, so I wonder if you'd elaborate a bit. Well, I'll explain the current idea. Um, uh, a B supergiant light, Sanduliac minus 69202, 
is uh, like a series, it's built like, a, like an onion, has a series of shells inside it. Uh, the innermost core of the onion is an iron nickel core in the B supergiant, and uh, surrounding it is a series of layers of different elements, silicon, uh, neon, uh, oxygen, carbon, helium, and on the very outermost parts, hydrogen. And there are, at the boundaries between the different shells, uh, uh, the lighter element is being processed into the heavier one. That's the energy source in such a star. And uh, what happened uh, in San Juliac minus 69202 was that the energy at the very center of the star gave out. Now the significance of that is that a star is a balance between a force of gravity which tends to uh, pull the star together, hold it together, and a force of gra and a and a force of pressure which tends to keep the star up, stops it from collapsing. And this source of pressure is the, is the energy generation. Once the energy generation gives out, uh, the star can't sustain itself and it collapses. And in San Juliac minus 69, 202, uh, the energy in the core gave out and so the core collapsed. The uh, uh, collapse of the core removed the uh, supporting mechanism for the outer parts, for the outer parts of the, of the, the outer uh, shells of the onion, and so the shells began to collapse. Uh, they uh, fell inwards, and they met a release of energy which had been given out as the core collapsed. The core, as the core falls in together on itself, it gives out an enormous amount of energy which turns around the infalling outer layers, and the outer layers of the star expand larger and larger and larger very, very quickly at speeds in this supernova of 15,000 kilometers a second or more. In point of fact, the collapse of the core is very sudden indeed, isn't it? Uh, the collapse is over in less than a minute, yes, only a matter of a few seconds. You can think of this uh, collapse as being like the uh, detonation of um, an industrial chimney, a demolition of an industrial chimney. Uh, an, uh, a charge is exploded at the base of the chimney and it removes the support for all the upper layers. <laughs> the upper layers all fall in on themselves and uh, the energy that they release scatters dusts and bricks around. Um, uh, which billows out, and we're now at the uh, billowing out stage of the supernova explosion. Well, that's the theory. Do you think this new outburst is going to throw any, well, any new light on it? Well, I think it already has. First of all, for the very first time, uh, there are some clues about the progenitor star in uh, this supernova. This is the first time, if this observation proves to be correct, that we know anything about the star which did the explosion, and it's the, exactly the sort of star which we would expect. But we ought to be a little bit careful yes. here because uh, there are some results from the International Ultraviolet Explorer satellite, uh, which has been monitoring the supernova uh, ever since it went off. The ultraviolet light from the supernova has already started to fade away. And uh, in the spectrum, the IUE scientists can already detect uh, the spectrum of San Juliac minus 69 202 coming back again, they say. If that turns out to be correct, uh, then San Juliac minus 69, 202 wasn't the star that exploded, and we'll have to rethink this problem. You may remember, Paul, that when this news from the IUE first came through, you and I were talking in your study, and things seemed a little strange then, and I did make the rather outrageous suggestion that this might be something rather new, that the supernova outburst was associated with the supergiant star, but wasn't actually inside it. And I just wonder whether that suggestion may be right after all. Uh, I think it's uh, possible. If uh, it was uh, a, a star which we can't see, then goodness knows what sort of star it was. Anyhow, there is this neutrino burst. Yes, this is a really exciting observation. Um, uh, there uh, have been detected a series of uh, neutrino bursts at the uh, Mont Blanc Neutrino Observatory. Now, most um, observatories that uh, you and I visit are at the tops of mountains, but there is one observatory which is right inside a mountain, um, in fact, in the Mont Blanc Tunnel. And it's designed to detect uh, neutrinos, solar neutrinos, in fact, but it can also detect uh, neutrinos from supernovae. Uh, the neutrinos are produced in the core collapse. As the core collapses, it squashes the electrons in the core into the protons in the core, the protons in the iron, in fact. And uh, uh, the protons and the uh, electrons combine to make a neutron. And in the course of that reaction, a neutrino is produced. It's kind of a byproduct of the, uh, of the nuclear reaction. And these neutrinos radiate out thousands upon millions, thousands of millions of them, all over space. And uh, they've crossed uh, the 155,000 light years of space between the Large Magellanic Cloud and us. 
and um, uh, they flooded practically untouched, in fact, uh, from the southern hemisphere of the Earth right along a diameter to this neutrino observatory in Mont Blanc. And there, just five of them have been detected in a pulse uh, which lasted about uh, seven seconds at about uh, three o'clock on the 23rd of February. And that was the moment, the very moment, uh, that the core collapsed and the uh, moment that the supernova appeared. Most amazing. And then, of course, it's also a radio source. Yes, again, for the first time, uh, uh, radio astronomers have detected a supernova at this very early stage, while the supernova explosion is going on. Uh, both the Fleur's radio telescope and the Malonglo radio telescope in New South Wales have uh, detected it. It's something to do with the compression of the magnetic field of the star as the layers spread outwards into space. Well, Paul, what are we going to see as this supernova goes on its way? Well, we'll either see a black hole or a neutron star. Right, which? I don't think anybody knows yet. Uh, what's clear from the neutrinos is that when the core collapse it takes place, uh, neutrons are formed. And if the collapse stops at that point, then we have a neutron star. Uh, we have, in fact, a, a, a pulsar, uh, just like the pulsar in the Crab Nebula or the other pulsar that you mentioned that have been discovered in the Large Magellanic Clouds from some previous supernova. And when the uh, debris of the explosion has cleared away, uh, we'll be able to see in the, um, in the, uh, in the, in the center of this debris uh, a flashing pulsar. As the star rotates, it'll flash a thousand times a second or so, uh, just like a lighthouse. It will probably also be an X-ray source, and the Anglo-Japanese satellite called Astro-C will probably see an X-ray source there. I understand that it's been monitoring this region of the sky over the last couple of weeks and seen nothing yet. What about gravitational waves? If the collapse of the core uh, continues past the neutron star stage, it'll make a black hole. And that'll produce uh, as a, a gravitational wave, a, uh, a wave of a kind that's never been seen before, though it's predicted by theory. Uh, uh, and if gravitational waves are seen in any of the gravitational wave detectors um, operating around the world, at the exact moment when the neutrinos were seen, that'll be a very exciting discovery indeed. Paul, could you sum up just what you think the supernova is going to tell us? Well, I think uh, there are two things that it could possibly tell us. One is it'll certainly tell us in much more detail than ever before about the supernova explosion itself. And secondly, the star shines like a beacon into the darkest regions of space so that we'll be able to see interstellar material which lies between the Large Magellanic Cloud and our own. That'll be very exciting, too. Paul, undoubtedly, this is one of the most important astronomical events for a very long time. And when we know a bit more about this supernova, I hope you'll talk about it again, because there certainly is going to be a great deal to learn. Paul, thank you very much. So we will, of course, keep you informed about the progress of the supernova. But um, our next program in April is going to be rather a special one. It's 30 years now since the sky at night started, and so we're having a special 50-minute anniversary program. And I very much hope you will join us then. So for the moment, from Paul and the supernova, and from me, good night.